Well, good morning. Good to be in God's house today, man. Men, if you have a Bible, I'd like you to turn to uh, Matthew chapter 5. And if you want to put a bookmark there, you might as well, because we're going to be working through um, Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7 in the new sermon series. The new sermon series is entitled, The Sermon on the Mount. Um, and I will go ahead and share with you, uh, this is no uh, coincidence, I believe it was God's way of guiding us, but... The uh, Bible study you ladies are going to be studying this fall, coming up here in a couple weeks, is the Sermon on the Mount. Um, I didn't follow Sandy's lead. She didn't follow my lead. She had found a Bible study, and she called me, and she said, uh, Don, you have any direction for this fall, you know, what you're thinking about preaching on? And, and I said, well, I've been praying about it because I feel God's lead me to preach through the Sermon on the Mount. And there was a pause. And then she said, that's exactly the Bible study that I had decided to, to lead the ladies through this, this fall. So I believe that God really wants to speak to us through these messages and through the study. And for you ladies taking this study, it's going to start in a couple weeks. And, and if you haven't signed up yet, you probably could, uh, but you need to do that right away. Uh, we're offering it Monday night and Tuesday morning. Uh, hopefully one of those would work. Uh, but it, it's going to be apparently, yeah, Danita? I'm leading the Monday night. Okay. Yes. It is. Yes. Yes. I, I looked at the book because I wanted to see you know what the content was and and now now Jen is it Jen? Yeah. Jen is going to teach it in in nine weeks. Uh, I'm going to take a lot longer than that. I have more time than than, than she does on this. So uh, we may even have to preach through some of this and then take a break like through uh, Christmas and then go back to it. But I just didn't feel like nine weeks did me justice. to. Pre I can take two words and preach a whole message on it. So i got to take my time with this. And to do justice, uh, I felt like I was going to take my time. And we're going to start out in Matthew chapter 5 uh, with the Sermon on the Mount. And the title of today's message, and it's actually for the next three weeks, we're going to talk about supremely blessed. Supremely blessed. And uh, this passage is known as the, the Beatitudes. And, and basically the Beatitudes, if you go back and take the root of that word, what it meant when Jesus was talking to them about being blessed was to be supremely blessed. How many of you feel like you're blessed by the Lord? Amen? Amen. I can tell you right now, the blessings that you have right now, they're amazing. You need to thank God for them, but God wants to bless you even more. Now, I am not saying prosperity type preaching or anything like that, but I'm saying we leave so much on the table, so much that God wants to give us to, and I'm not talking about material wealth necessarily, I'm talking about blessings. How many of you have been blessed and it's not necessarily in a material way, amen? God wants to bless us in so many ways, and, and I want to look at these passages, and I want to look at these scriptures, and, and I want us to see how Jesus was trying to tell these people, we, God wants to bless you so, supreme, so supremely. Now, the Sermon on the Mount was basically a sermon that Jesus preached on a mountainside. And, and Lisa and I have been there to the, where he preached the Sermon on the Mount. An awesome place, beautiful place. And uh, we got to see where the Sermon on the Mount was preached, or at least the approximate spot where it was. They know the mountainside, not the exact spot he stood or, or that he sat when he was preaching. But uh, it was an amazing sight. Now, I know that... Um, being supremely blessed has a different mindset to, to all of you. Different things come to your mind. But the supremely blessed that I believe that, that Jesus is talking about here, that we're going to begin with today, is, is how to find divine joy. Divine joy. In other words, it's not a joy that's circumstantial. It's an uncircumstantially related type of joy and, and happiness and, and perfect peace. Now, now, everybody here is going through different things in your life. Anybody just have a perfect life and nothing wrong whatsoever? I didn't think so. We all have things we deal with, and because we live in a fallen world, we live in a messed up society, uh, this country, just things are going, uh, going south. I mean, just everything's going wrong. But we can still find that divine joy, that perfect peace, uncircumstantial happiness that Jesus wanted to give them. Now, the first step, and what I want to talk about today in this passage is about altering our lives. Altering our lives. That's the first part one of this message on being supremely blessed is to alter our lives. And, and so the big idea here is this. If you want to be supremely blessed, does anybody here want to be supremely blessed? If you want to be supremely blessed by God, you must be willing to alter your life to God. 
You can't expect God to pour out his blessings on someone who's not willing to alter their life to fit the pattern of what God wants and expects of us. So we have to be willing to do that. We're the ones that need to move, not God. We're the ones that need to change, not God. We're the ones who need to surrender everything to him. He's not the one. He surrendered it all to us. He gave us his son, Jesus, so that we could receive the supreme blessings that he wants to give to us. Now, we're going to look at verses 1 and 2 today, but I want to set the context. So I asked Jason to include all 12 verses. In in fact, in the ladies' Bible study, this is going to be a part of it. You're going to read through the whole Sermon on the Mount several times, nine times. Uh, We're going to read through this passage, 1 through 12, together to kind of set the stage. And then I'm I'm just going to talk about verses 1 and 2 today. That's, That's enough for today. Uh, unless you want to be here till about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Eric, you want to be here till 3 in the afternoon? Okay. Uh, here, here's the deal. My grandsons came and stayed with us last night, with, some with mom and dad. Some, it, we found out it's better to d- divide them up and conquer, right? So we did that. Well, they came, and, the, and, and my stipulation to Eric and Jacqueline was this. I want you guys to come down for church. Now, they're attending church up in Mount Sterling, up in the area. But I said, I want you to come for church and, and pick the boys up because my Vikings are playing at noon today. And the race is on at 1 o'clock today. Okay? And we got all these things going. And he said, well, don't worry. My Chiefs play at, at noon also. So he said, Dad, if you're not done by 11.15, I'm going to start hitting my wrist saying it's time to go. So i got to keep moving on this to, to be able to, do the, to, to get through this. But I don't even know where that was going. But, but anyway, anyway. We're going to look at verses 1 and 2 instead of the whole verses all the way through 12. But I want to read through this to, to, to try to set the stage uh, for the many messages that, that, that I want to speak out of this. For the, for the maximum benefit that, that we can get from this and how we can become supremely blessed. So let's, let's stand. The Sermon on the Mount begins this way. Matthew chapter 5 starting in verse 1. And seeing the multitudes, he, being Jesus, went up on a mountain. And when he was seated, uh, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Let us pray. Father, we come to you. We thank you, God, for this day and this moment in time when we look at your word. I pray, God, that your word would speak into our lives, into our hearts, into the very soul, our souls today, Lord, and convict us and convince us and and encourage us and change us in whatever you see fit today, God. Father, I pray, speak to each and every one represented here today, each and every one who may be listening today or watching today, Lord. Just speak into our lives, God. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. So this morning we're talking about supreme blessings. Everybody here wants to be supremely blessed by God. I cannot imagine anyone who would not want that. But to be supremely blessed, we must alter our lives to God. That's the first concept that we have to get. We must alter our lives to God. Now, how do we do that? I think we can look at verses 1 and 2 and see that. First of all, we alter our lives to God by deepening our level of commitment. By deepening our level of commitment. That's what Jesus is trying to teach them here. That's what Jesus would want us to know today. He wants each and every one of us, no matter what level you're at right now, your walk with God until you die, until you leave this earth, should be deepening with Him. A lot of people stay on the surface 
A lot of people never go deep into God's Word to know exactly the depths of what Christ wants to do, what He wants to give us, how He wants to bless us, and we never get past that superficial stage. I think there's a lot of superficial Christians in this world today. They're on the level of that surface and they never go deep into what God has for them. In fact, you can kind of liken that to what was happening here. There was a group of people who had gathered to listen to Jesus, to, to see what Jesus could do for them, but each one of them had a different level of commitment. It, it's kind of like whenever someone gathers, uh, let, let's say for instance, let me give you a for instance, it, it happens in every group that gathers. Sometimes there's organizations that you're a part of. It may be a, a club, it may be a, a, a nonprofit organization, it may be to help somebody to, to, to do something, it could be uh, an activity or whatever it may be, but you gather together and there's a group of people, no matter how large that size is. And, and all in that, and some of you have been there, so you're going to relate, resonate with this, in that you've got people who are just committed on the surface. They just kind of stay at that superficial level. They may show up. They may not. They, they may take part in, in what you're doing. They may not. But they always stay right there on that superficial level. And then you've got those that go a little bit deeper. And they commit just a little bit deeper to, to what's going on. They, they buy in. Uh, they're vested a little bit more. They're there. They, they, they listen. They try to respond if they can. And then you've got those that are, are the core of the group. You've got that core group that if it wasn't for them, things probably wouldn't get done. And most of them are in the leadership level of that. Uh, a lot of them may not be, uh, have a leader and namesake, but they're behind the scenes. You know these people are going to get the job done. These people are, what are the glue that hold it together. Now it could be uh, some kind of an organization. It could be some kind of a, a group or a club. It could be a committee, whatever it may be. But you've got all these different levels of commitment. It, it, it's kind of that way whenever I look at, at a church. You know, you've got a church and you've got people who are, are just kind of attenders. They come in and out and they attend once in a while. They, they may even be members. They may be on the rolls. But you, ha you, you may not see them very often. In fact, you very rarely see them. And we have a lot of members of this church you never see. In fact, if every member was here that was on the rolls of our church, we couldn't hold everybody in this church building. It would probably take five services to, fill, to, to be able to accommodate that. But you've got that superficial level of people that they're really, you know, they may show up, they may not. If there's something in it for them, they may come. Some kind of an activity, they may show up, but that's about it. And then you've got the ones that they commit a little bit deeper. that They commit to being in church, you know, a little more regularly, and, and they, they try to come to maybe a Sunday school or a ladies' Bible study or, or a parenting class or something like that. But it's just kind of hit and miss on whether they really buy in and commit. But they're kind of there, but they're really, you just don't know. And then you've got that level that's like the core. The same way in an organization. The church is like an organization, but it's also an organism. It's a, it's a living being. It's, it's a living part because God is in it and we're alive. And, and, and then you've got that core group that if that core group didn't do what they did, things would not happen. It just wouldn't exist. The church would fall apart. And you have that level of commitment. It's the same thing that happened in Jesus' day. When they were following Christ, you had the multitudes. Look at verse 1. And seeing the multitudes, Jesus went up on a mountainside, and he was seated with his, with his disciples. They came to him. So what you've got here is a picture of, an, of a group of people, just like we see today, a group of people that you've got multitudes that are there. And, and a lot of them, they're there for an okay reason, but not the best reason. They were there because Jesus was doing miracles. He was feeding people. He was healing people. He was, he was ministering to people. And so they were there so they could see what they could get out of it. Now, I can tell you this right now, and I'm not trying to be harsh, and I don't, I'm not pointing any fingers, but if you're here in this church as a part of this body of believers, just for what you can get out of it, then you're superficial. You're not in it like Jesus wants you to be. If I get my way, if I get what I want, if I get fed, if I get this, if I get that, I'm okay. But if not, I may or may not be there. I probably won't be there. And, and, and you have that. And that's kind of where the multitudes were. They were there. They were listening, kind of. But they weren't getting it. And, and then you have the next level. And, and I think this level showed up in Jesus' day. Whenever Jesus died on the cross, Jesus, they took him to the tomb. And Jesus died a, a, a lonely death. 
Jesus died alone, and he died for the sins of the world. And luckily, Joseph of Arimathea took his body, and they buried him and Nicodemus. And after Jesus died, people kind of went on their way, and they didn't think any more about it. They forgot. Now, looking back, we say, how could they do that? Jesus told them he was going to rise from the dead. But they didn't realize that until after the fact. But after Jesus had risen from the dead, and Jesus has risen from the dead, amen? Okay, that makes all the difference in the world for us here today. That's a game changer. That should change your level of commitment. After that, before Jesus uh, left this earth, he said, you gather, and then before I leave, I'm going to give you the gift of the Holy Spirit. And, and so they gathered together. You know how many people were there? About 120 gathered in the upper room or in that area so that they could worship God. They believed. 120 that were a little more committed. Where were the multitudes at? They were gone. They missed out. The 120 were there, but they still hadn't completely bought in. And then you had the 12. You had the 12 disciples. Now, it's a proven fact that if someone wants to disciple someone, about 10 or 12 people is all you can really disciple very well at, at a time. That's why whenever you have a, a Sunday school class or a small group or something like that, any more than 12, it kind of gets hard to disciple really on a deeper level. And, and so... Anyway, they, the, the, the 12 had gathered, and they were sitting at Jesus' feet. Now, the rest of them were there, but they didn't get it. But the 12 did. And Jesus tried to pour his life into that 12. Why? Because they were more committed. They were ready to go deeper. Sometimes they messed up. You know, as a pastor, I, sometimes I messed up. I, I still do. But I still want to go deeper with God. And, and so, you don't have to be perfect to be a deep, committed follower of Jesus. Don't let Satan tell you just because you mess up every now and then that you can't go deeper with God. That's not true. But it's that level that we have to do to be able to go deeper into altering our lives to be blessed by God. So I ask you this first question. How deeply are you committed to God? Think about your life. Think about your walk. Think about your attendance. Think about your buy-in to Bible studies and Sunday school and, and, and this and all the things that we offer, are you really committed on the level that God expects of us? If not, why not? Do you want to be supremely blessed? Then you have to go to a deeper level. I want to be like the 12. I want to be following Jesus and, and knowing His every word. Next thing, we alter our lives, first of all, by deepening our level of commitment, but then we alter our lives by extending the lengths we will go. Extending the lengths we will go. Now, they gathered on the mountainside. And like I said, I, I saw the Mount of Beatitudes, beautiful place. And, and they didn't have, you know, the church buildings they came into like we do today. But they gathered on the mountainside out in God's creation. And Jesus sat down and he began to speak to them. That's the whole Sermon on the Mount was preached outside on a mountainside. And the people gathered around of every level of commitment. But they had to really commit to being there. You know what it takes to be in the presence of God? Now listen to me, guys. You know what it takes for you to be in the presence of God? It takes effort. You don't just say, okay, God, I'm here, and, you know, we serve an almighty God. Now, you can be in God's presence no matter where you are. Are, are you in God's presence today? You know, I, I think some of us forget that when we come into God's house and we worship the one true living God and Jesus Christ is our advocate at the right hand of the Father, we are coming into God's presence I think a lot of times we don't see the, the supreme blessings of God because we come into church with a kind of just a superficial attitude of, okay, I'm coming to church, I'll sing a few songs, I'll listen to what the preacher has to say, and I'm going home. Is that really coming into the presence of God? How many of you have had experiences where you know you were in the presence of God? Anybody? When you're there, you know you're there. When it happens, you know that it's happening. You know what it takes? It takes effort. God expects us to put the effort out into it. Now, I'm not saying you do magical things and it happens. I'm saying God expects us to put effort into worshiping Him. You know, any goals that we achieve in life take effort. If we're going to achieve something, it takes effort. Now, to some people, it may seem effortless, the things you do. But on the other side, there was effort that was put into that. And, and, and it's like this. I... I have always had a fascination with the banjo. A lot of you guys know that. I, I just, I'd love to be able to play the banjo. My mom and dad bought me one about how many years ago now? It's probably been 10 years ago. And, and you know what? 
I still can't play the banjo. They even bought me lessons from Harry Kingery, the banjo king. I didn't go. Why? I'm too busy. I got too many things to go. I know that it's going to take effort to learn how to do that. And, and so finally, I'm thinking, and, and I'll, I'll let you know this, so you, your, your investment's not totally lost. I, I've decided in the last couple months I'm really going to work harder on trying to play this banjo, figure out how to play it. So you know what I did? I went to Larry Collins. Now, Larry's out in the hallway. Is Susan in here? Okay, Susan, you're going to have to fill him in, okay? So I went to Larry. I said, Larry, let's get together. Larry's retired now. Uh, Susan, how is that? He's retired and you're still having to work. It's okay for now, right? Yes, yes. And you're working hard. I know you told me what's happening. But I went to Larry's house and I said, Larry, I, I need to learn how to do this thing. You know what it takes to play a banjo? It takes effort. And, and I'm not saying every, anybody and everybody can play it, but I think anybody or everybody can pick around on it and kind of learn some things. And that's probably where I'm going to be at. So I went and I put the effort in and I go and he says, you've got to practice at least 15 or 20 minutes every day. Not an hour or two hours, you'll burn out on it, about 15 minutes. You know what that means? Every day I have to put effort into learning how to play that thing. And it's not an easy instrument to play. You have to use muscle memory. You have to use to where you have to be able to use your right hand, not even think about what you're doing. Now, I can't hardly walk and chew gum without thinking about it, so I'm, I'm in trouble. But I do know that it takes effort. So, Larry, he started every day, have you practiced your banjo? Have you practiced your banjo? And finally, I'm getting tired of it. Oh, Larry, leave me alone. <laughs> and so I found a way to get back to him. I said, Larry, and, and so I got it. I started bike riding. I used to walk. I used to like to walk a few miles every day. I can't do it anymore. My, my hips and my knees, they won't let me do it. So I, I found a bike, and I thought, I'm going to try a bike because they say it's easier on your joints. Well, I started riding a bike, and I'm catching on to that, and I'm getting better. The first couple days, I thought I was going to die. But I made it through, and I've just, every day I ride that bike, two, three miles, four miles, five miles, something like that. Every day I ride it, and I'm finding every day it's getting a little easier. I talked to Larry about that. I said, Larry, I said, I'm riding a bike. He said, I've got a bike, and he said, I need to be riding it. I thought, yes, you do. <laughs> so every day I have this little tracker that shows where I went and how many miles and how many calories and all that, and I text that to Larry. I said, how's your bike riding going today? And then he turns around and he says, how's your banjo picking going today? <laughs> Do you know what's happened with that, Merle? Uh, I could imagine. Yeah. We have a lot of fun with that. You know what happens whenever you don't want to put the effort into something? You need somebody to keep you accountable. Got it? Amen. You need somebody to keep you accountable. Merle, where have you been the last two Sundays? Uh, I'm here now, right? <laughs> yes. Accountability. What's that? He's been playing his guitar, okay. Hopefully for the Lord then, okay? Yeah. Yes, okay. So you've been practicing to play up here, right? Amen. Not getting carried away. <laughs> <laughs> next, week. next week, okay, okay. Now you're accountable, Merle. <laughs> so, so accountability. So I know if I don't practice that banjo, Larry's going to get on to me. And he knows if he doesn't ride that bike. He told me I sent a text and I went like three and a half miles. No big deal, but it is to me. And Larry said, if I did that, I'd have to make my end destination a line hospital because I'd pass out dead. <laughs> so he's starting to ride his bike. I'm starting to play the banjo. I'm putting the effort in, we're seeing progress. Do you know what it takes for you to, to grow in the Lord and to go deeper and to go farther? You've got to put the effort into it. It's not going to happen automatic. You can't sit here and listen to a preacher and just sit here and listen and grow. It's not going to happen. You've got to put effort into it. If you don't put the effort into it, if you don't have the accountability to it, are you accountable to anybody for your walk with the Lord? Are you? If you're not, that's a dangerous place to be. We need to be accountable for the way we're living for God. If not, we're not going to be supremely blessed. Jesus held his disciples accountable for the way they lived their life. But you know what? That's hard. Because all of a sudden, we are accountable... And we don't like that. I don't want somebody to tell me every day I need to be practicing that banjo. Larry doesn't want anybody to tell him he's got to ride his bike three miles a day. But you know what? We put the effort in because we're accountable. Sometimes I think just coming to church, you're not accountable to anybody whether you come to church or not. You're not accountable if, you, if you're not in a Bible study and a group of people, about 12 people, you know, and, and you're learning and God's saying, you know what? I'm going to use these people to help you to grow. You see, we've got to extend the lengths we will go. 
The next thing to alter our lives, we, have to, we do that by identifying the leader we are following. We do that by identifying the leader we're following. Now, this may sound like a no-brainer. Duh, I, I know this. I'm following Jesus, preacher. I know that. I'm following Jesus. How could you say that? Well, you need to do a diagnostic. The first diagnostic you can do is to say, who am I actually following? Now, you know how you do that? Well, the first thing you can do is this. You think about somebody that's really important to you in your faith right here in this church. Somebody that you look up to, somebody that you count on, somebody that you just think that that's the person you know that I really admire. And what if that person wasn't here anymore? What if that person let you down? What if that person said something about you that hurt you? What if that person all of a sudden wasn't in your life anymore? Would you still come to church? Would you still be a disciple of Jesus? Would you still follow him? What if somebody upsets you? I don't know how many people in church are gone, and I say, oh, you know, I, I miss you. Why are you not here? Well, this person upset me, or this person said something, or I don't like this, or something didn't go this way, or whatever. You know what? That is following man, not Jesus. Amen. Bottom line, I'm not pointing fingers. You're here. But there's a lot of people who are not here, and I ask them, why are you not in church? And they give me a person's name, or a thing that happened, or something wrong, and, and that is not following Jesus. Amen. Now, there are times that I'm, I'm going to say that things can happen severe enough that something needs to happen. You know what needs to happen? You need to sit down and say, we've got to work this out. But we're not willing to be accountable. We've got to identify who we're following and why. Why am I following Jesus? How many of you following Jesus? Say amen. amen. Why are you following him? Why are you following Jesus? Could it be that I'm following Jesus because if I need something or I want something, I know I can go to Jesus and I can pray and he's going to give it to me. That's the wrong reason to follow Jesus. Following Jesus is more about what we can give him than what we can get out of him. If you're in it for more, than what you, for more of what you can get from him, if you're more about being blessed than you're about blessing him and living for him, then you're not following Jesus the right way. Maybe it's a crutch. Sometimes I see people, have you ever seen somebody who has something wrong in their life and you see them come into church, come to a preacher, come to this, I see it all the time, and, and I, you counsel with them, you help them, you welcome them, and it's like they use Jesus just long enough to get through what they're going through and then you don't see him anymore. That's the wrong reason to follow Jesus. Maybe it's a feel good. A lot of people go, I come to church because it makes me feel good. Well, that's all right, but what about when it, you don't feel so good? What about when you come to church and it does take effort and it is hard and you are dealing with some things and maybe something in the church or whatever, but you push through. It's not about a feel good feeling. Now, I want you to feel good when you leave this place, but I also want you to feel convicted. I want you to feel like you need to change. I want you to feel like I can do this, but it's going to take effort. And when you leave this place, not just, man, I got my time into church and I feel good today. Following Jesus for a feel-good feeling is not the reason to follow Jesus. You know why you should be following Jesus? I'll tell you, because in your mind, there's no other option except Him. That's exactly what the disciples did in John chapter 6. You know, the multitudes were following Jesus, and he said, if you don't drink my blood and eat my flesh, you cannot be my disciple. You can't inherit the kingdom of God. You know what happened? Multitudes of people left Jesus at that time. You know why they let, left Jesus? Because it got hard. It took effort. They didn't understand. They didn't stick with it. And he turned to his disciples. He said, what about you? You know what his disciples said? Who else would we go to, Jesus? Jesus said, do you want to desert me too? Do you want to leave me now too? Where, where else would we go, Jesus? We, all we know is you. We've given up everything, and because of that, no matter what, Jesus, now, now they still failed him, but they were following Jesus to the point that, what else would I do? H how about this? If you follow Jesus in such a way as, I don't know what else I'd do if I didn't have Jesus. There's no way I could live. I've given everything to him. I've devoted my whole life to him. And I'm going to serve him in whatever way he calls. And Jesus, what else would I do? There's no other way but you. You know, when it gets hard, and some of you are going through some hard things right now. I'm, I know. 
we begin to identify who we're really following. Last thing I want you to hear today. We alter our lives, number one, by deepening our level of commitment. Number two, by extending our lengths, we will go. Number three, by identifying the leader, the true, genuine leader we're actually following. And number four, by intensifying our listening and our learning. By intensifying our listening and our learning. What do I mean by that? Sometimes we need to alter the way we listen, the way we learn. The degree of importance will change that. I'm not saying you should hang on to the words, every word that the preacher says. But if the preacher's preaching the Word of God and preaching Jesus' words, then you ought to hang on those words. You know, sometimes we need to alter the level of importance of listening to what God's trying to speak to us. You know, it's kind of like this. We adjust the level of how much we listen by how important we feel it is. Merle, when Becky tells you something to do, how deeply do you listen to what she has to say? Yeah. yeah. But when she puts her finger on the end of your nose and says, Mr. Howland, you better do this, that means you're going to listen to what she has to say. We do that in church, don't we? We alter the level of how we listen. How well did you listen today? I don't know. But I do know this. You should be hanging on every word that God wants to speak to you today. It's kind of like this. Everybody here has a different level of how they hold on to what God wants to say. Whenever we, Lisa and I, whenever we go on trips, a lot of times we have to fly on airplanes. Go Costa Rica, different places. She knows where I'm going with this. I've used this before, but it's a perfect illustration. We've flown probably a hundred times now, and it's probably getting close to that. And every time that you fly, and how many of you have flown in an airplane before? Okay, most of you. You get on the plane and you sit down and, and of course, my fear is claustrophobia. I don't like the plane to be so small. You know, I don't like to be confined. Lisa has a whole different type of fear. A and it's a real fear to her. And whenever the stewardess gets up and they have to go through their spiel, ladies and gentlemen, now pay attention to the stewardess, you know, and she gets up and she says, you know, in case of an emergency, you know, here's the exits and there's the exits and, and you pull this card out, it shows you how to put your oxygen mask on if you lose pressure, you know, cabin pressure and, and if you, uh, you know, and, and, and all these different instructions, the flotation device, you know, that you can use your seat as a cushion, all that, they go through all these different things. You know what 90% of the plane is doing at that time? Sleeping, talking, not paying attention. You know what my wife is doing? She's got that right paper right up in front of her. And she's looking at that. And she's watching that stewardess and listening to every word that they say. You know, she listens very intently to what they have. She's heard it a hundred times now. But she's still listening like her life depends on it. You know why? Someday her life may depend on that. And you know what? You know what's going to happen whenever there's an emergency in an airplane? You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to be right by her. I'm going to be sitting by her anyway. But if, she, if we need to know that the emergency exit is six rows out and to the right and all that, I'm, I'm grabbing a hold of her because she knows where she's going. She's going to know how to get out of the plane. I'm going to be trying to suck for oxygen. She's the one going to be put the mask on me because I don't pay attention. Why? Because my level of listening and learning is not where it should be. What if we treated the Word of God that way? And what if today you treated the Word of God listening and learning and knowing what He wants from you and, and in you today was so intense that you were looking at every word on the page of the Word of God when the preacher read it? And whenever the points were put out there and whenever speaking was happening, whenever things were happening, you were listening very intently. Now, I know some of you say you listen with your eyes closed. I kind of believe you, kind of don't. But I can tell you right now, if I could somehow convince you that Jesus is coming back at noon, and Eric, you'd miss your game if he came back at noon, I'm sorry. I would too. If Jesus was coming back at noon, and this is exactly what you need to do, and this is exactly how you need to act, and this is exactly where you need to be, I'll bet you you'd be wide-eyed and listening with everything that you have. Do you know every day you go out into the world, it's life and death situations. 
Every day you go out into the world, there's a spiritual battle. Are you going to live for God? You're going to live for the world. You're going to live for God? You're going to live for me. Are you going to live for God? You're going to do the things you want. And we need to listen and learn to what God has to say. There's going to be crisis coming up in your life. Some of you this week will face a major crisis. I don't know who it is. I don't know what it's going to be. But somebody will face a major crisis. And then you're going to say, oh, what did the preacher say? What does God's word say? What, what do I need to do? Because we're not listening intently to what God's trying to tell us. You know, maybe today some of you, some of us, need to alter our level of listening to God. Intensely listen to everything he has to say. So is Bruce, you going to come play today? I want to ask you this question. Are you willing to make the necessary alterations in your life today? Somebody say, okay, preacher, I'm good to go. I, you know, I, I, I'm all right. I'm getting by okay. Is that all you want out of life in God and Jesus? I think there's some people here today, and probably including myself, knowingly including myself, that there needs to be some alterations in my life in order to be supremely blessed by God. Do you know there's a couple words that sometimes I get mixed up, my wife makes fun of me, but you know, alteration and altercation sound a lot alike, don't they, Lisa? Alteration, altercation. Now there's a big difference, isn't there? But I came up with this. If you're going to alter your life to the level of what God wants you to be, you're going to have an altercation with the devil. You're going to go to battle with him. There's going to be pain. There's going to be suffering. There's going to be hard things to do. But don't you want to go deeper with God? Are, are, are you content with where you are in the Lord? Preacher, I don't know my Bible like I should. Well, it's not God's fault. I don't pray like I should. I don't... I don't, I don't I've got this problem with this person. I, I'm struggling with this God. And, and why isn't God answering me? Or, 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 or there's something that, that I'm upset with. And, and maybe somebody in this church. And maybe it's because God's trying to take us deeper. So today at this invitation time, there may be somebody who needs to just simply come to this altar. And, or maybe even where you are. Just rededicate your life to the Lord in all these areas. You can do that or you can ignore it and just go on your way and nothing's ever going to change. It takes effort. Most people are never willing to put the effort into really following God like he, he asked us to. So we never seen the supreme blessings that no matter what's happened, I've seen people in my life that are so committed to the Lord, so, so in, so following the Lord, that they can have this major crisis going on in their, uh, in their life. And as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And, and no matter what, my trust is in Jesus. And I can face anything. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And that sounds good until you've got to do it. It takes effort. Maybe there's somebody here today that needs Christ in their life. And you've never really given your life to Jesus. And you can never be supremely blessed by God until you belong to God. And you need to give your life to Christ today. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. I thank you that you love us so much to send your son Jesus to teach us, to lead us, to set down on that hillside 2,000 years ago and teach us how to be supremely blessed. First of all, it's a relationship with you that was bought through his blood, his death, his burial, and the resurrection of new life. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we have, as Christians, we have... So many things, God, that we need to be serving you deeper and farther and really make sure we're following Jesus and not someone else and, and really just being sold out listening and learning from you, God. Help us, God. We're the last best hope for this world, and if we don't get it, they never will, God. Father, help us to respond right in where we are in our seats, God, to pray, but even at this altar to come and say, God, I just... I want to hear your word through these messages. The Sermon on the Mount. Jesus, the greatest sermon ever preached. Pray for your pastor. Lord, I pray that I would be even close to, to bringing out the truth of this in a way that you would want me to, God. The power that's in it. Father, we love you. We
pray for people to respond to your word today. In Jesus' name, amen.